Thank you guys. Know that, that we already miss you. We wish you were taking some of these other folks with you because we don't like some of them very <laughs> We miss you already. I'm just kidding. Sort of. I am kidding. Hey, uh, I've said it a couple of times already. I really am glad that you are here, whether that's here in this room, in person, or you're with us online. Uh, it's so so good to see you, to be with you. Uh, we are continuing our, our journey through the book of Philippians this morning. We uh, um, accomplished a major milestone last week and finished chapter one in uh, no less than five weeks, but that's okay. Um, it's not a sprint, right? It's a marathon. It's a marathon. So we're going to dive into chapter two today. Speaking of chapters, uh, sometimes I, I find myself, um, uh, sometimes I find that it's helpful to remember. It seems so elementary to say that, and I feel like some of you are probably, probably saying to yourselves, well, duh, everybody knows that, but, but it's just something, it's one of those really elementary things that I'm not often mindful of, and so what that does for me is it points me back to the fact of one of the reminders we've returned to every single week, and that's the fact that Philippians is not a book, um, and it, originally it was not segmented into chapters with verses, but it's a letter. It was a letter written by a guy to a group of folks that he cared deeply about. Uh, verses and chapters are helpful when it comes to, to doing things like we are here, gathering and, and navigating to specific places in the scriptures. But when it comes to reading, oftentimes, I've, I've, I've noticed in myself that, man, you can really get, uh, you can sort of compartmentalize the scriptures when you just focus on those numbers. So my challenge to you is this. Um, if you find yourself with time in the next couple of weeks, uh, the book of Philippians is only four chapters long. Sit down and read it. Don't pay attention to those chapters and those verse numbers. Just read it straight through and see if you find yourself sensing some different things and getting a different feel uh, from, from the text. See if it feels more like a letter and less like uh, sort of a, uh, the compartmentalized version that we get oftentimes in the scriptures. So something else that gets added um, to the original text is um, punctuation, right? Punctuation, uh, in, uh, the original uh, scripts of the New Testament were written in Koine Greek. So in, in Koine Greek, uh, punctuation is very much different than the English language. Um, in English, depending on which translation you read, we're going to look at verses 1 through 4 in chapter 2 in Philippians today. In English, uh, you can have anywhere from three to, to eight sentences in those four short verses. In the Greek, it's all one sentence. Like, it is all one continuous thought, which I think is a really interesting detail. Um, but had Paul written, uh, written this, these verses for us in English today, and we had been in English class, I feel like he would have gotten in trouble for writing a run-on sentence. Uh, but, but we won't hold that against him. So I'm talking about the text, um, so what I would love to do next is for us to dive straight into the text. So the coordinates are Philippians chapter 2, and I'm going to read for us verses 1 through 4. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from His love, any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful today for your word. Uh, we're grateful for the moment to, to sit down in front of it and to, to open it together. Uh, Lord, would you use the words of Paul today to instruct us, to teach us, to, to mold us and shape us into, um, into people who look much more like yourself and less like ourselves. Lord, we know that you'll be faithful to do that today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, um, question for you. Have you been asked a question lately where it was clear that the person asking the question already knew the answer? You have one of those questions, like the answer was just so obvious. Like, have you been pulled over lately? And did you get the, uh, the age-old question, uh, sir, do you know why I pulled you over? 
Isn't that what they usually ask? Do you know why I pulled you over? And typically we know the answer to that question. Uh, another place my brain drifts when I, I entertain that question is, uh, how about the, uh, the Geico commercial where the camel is wandering through the office asking everybody if they know what day it is? You've seen the commercial, what day is it? Hump day. It's a great commercial. Love it. Love it. Have you seen any animal shaming videos lately? Oh, they're fantastic. Uh, these are pictures with words on them. I grabbed a couple. You can't, I don't know if you can read that or not. It says, I, I uh, steal bread from kids, is what the sign with that, uh, that poor little golden retriever there says. But typically, if you watch the video, somebody will be videoing their pet, and they'll be sitting amongst a giant mess, and they'll be saying, what did you do? And it's so obvious that they have just destroyed. There's another, yeah, it's a French bulldog. It says, zero days since I ate a magazine. And you can see the remnants there in the background. Uh, honestly, I thought about just doing nothing but that for the rest of the time that we are here today. I know some of you would appreciate that. But you got me instead, so deal with it. Um, so clearly in all, oh, I, I need to talk about Ellie for just a second. Um, uh, if we were to do uh, an, an animal shaming video with our blonde weenie dog, Ellie, uh, it wouldn't matter at all. Like she couldn't care less about anybody in the world other than just her. In fact, in her brain, uh, Stacy and I should just feel privileged to live in her house and sleep in her bed. That is how it works at our house. She runs the place. So clearly in all of those examples, there is no need for a question because the answers to the questions are obvious. They're just obvious. So asking questions with clear and obvious answers is kind of what Paul does in this first verse in chapter 2. In verse 1, he asks four questions. Uh, the first one is about encouragement. He asks, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? In other words, does belonging to Christ, does belonging to Christ result in you living your life in an encouraged way? I would assume that many of us would say yes. Yes, it does. My relationship with Jesus helps me to feel encouraged. Paul's second question is, uh, has to do with comfort. He asks, any, is there any comfort from Christ's love? In other words, do you find yourself feeling a sense of comfort when you're reminded that you're loved by God? And I would say most of us would say, yeah, yeah, we sure do. His third question is about fellowship. Any fellowship together in the Spirit? In other words, are you surrounded by people that love and care for you and that you in turn love and care for? Yes, many of us, I would say, would probably answer yes to that question as well. And his last question is, are your hearts tender and compassionate? Are you finding yourselves enabled to love and care for others as you're knowledgeable of the fact that you yourself are loved and cared for? Many of us would say yes. That, the answer to that question is obvious. Yes, of course. So if you take into consideration the, the rest of the, the letter that Paul writes that surrounds these these verses, and you pay attention kind of to the tone. I know it's, it's, it's in print, but, but Paul has a particular tone when he writes. If you pay attention to that, it becomes clear that, that Paul's purpose is to encourage, to lift up, to, to praise these folks. He's kind of cheering them on, and he is inviting them to be re, uh, mindful of the fact that, that God began an, a, a good work in them, right? And he's going he's gonna to complete that work. Now, if a person were to choose to neglect that context, to neglect all of that surrounding information, in other words, if a person were to choose to, to rip verse 1 out of the backdrop of the rest of Paul's letter that he writes, then you can understand these questions in a totally different way. I found myself kind of wrestling with that earlier this week. His first question, again, is about encouragement. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? You could easily understand those words to mean... You belong to Christ. Why don't you feel encouraged? Do you see the difference? Totally different tone, right? It comes across in totally different ways. Second question, uh, is there any comfort in Christ's love? Again, it would be really easy to paint that question in a negative light and understand Paul to be asking, why aren't you finding comfort in Christ's love? But that's not what he says at all. Um, the third question uh, is about fellowship. Uh, any fellowship together in the Spirit? It would be really easy to replace uh, or to put a why on the front of this question and replace the, the is with an isn't, and you have the question, why isn't there any fellowship among you? Right? Like that, the tone helps us to, to do that if you were to go that route. So there's a couple of things that I, I think it would be, be wise for us to kind of pause and be mindful of here. One is this. Uh, this verse serves as another great example of the importance of context. Like, friends, context is so important. Paul didn't write the words in his letter to, to Philippi with us in mind today, right? Americans in the 21st century on the other side of the world were nowhere on 
Paul's radar. Uh, We just weren't. God can and does, and hopefully today we'll use these words to work in us, but that was nowhere on Paul's radar. Paul's purpose was to communicate with a a specific group of people in a really specific location, at a specific moment in history, in a specific religious and socioeconomic and cultural setting. There were tons of specifics that Paul had in mind, and if we want to truly understand kind of what Paul's getting at, then we have to take all of that into consideration, and we have to avoid just kind of making those words mean what we want them to, right? You don't want to do that. So friends, the next time you find yourself, you encounter a a, a verse of scripture and you find yourself scratching your head a little bit and you're like, huh, is that really what he meant? Is he really, is that really what Paul was saying? Can I just encourage you to do some work, uh, to open your Bible, to read that verse and then to read the verses around it and then to read the section, maybe even read the whole letter it's a part of or book it's a part of. Uh, Can I encourage you to grab a study Bible and maybe read a little bit if it's Paul about Paul? And where he was that particular time in in history, can I encourage us to appreciate the privilege and the blessings we have of being educated? Uh, man, I don't know what the statistic is, but but many of us in this room are educated a lot more than a lot of other folks in the world. We need to appreciate that blessing. And another blessing we need to appreciate the fact is the access we have to the scriptures. And not just the scriptures, but man, there is mountains of resources out there that are completely free that we can access to dig further into the scriptures. So I wonder how many of us are appreciating those blessings and digging into and being formed and shaped by the text. I hope lots, but maybe some of us needed to hear that today. Second thing I want us to pick up on here is this. If I'm honest today, there's a part of me that kind of gets really sensitive, like kind of hypersensitive when I read this verse in this first verse in Philippians chapter 2. And the reason I get hypersensitive is because I can, if I want to, I can, I can sense just a little bit of sarcasm in Paul's words, right? Like a little bit of, of sarcasm. Now, so, sarcasm is so popular these days. Like many of us have probably already said uh, a number of sarcastic things this morning. I bet we have. Um, it, it's especially, uh, sarcasm is especially employed whenever somebody wants to take a stab at somebody or to cut somebody down. Now, again, in the, the context, right, if you read these questions within the context of Paul's letters, you know that he is, he's actually applauding the Philippian folk. He has no, no intention to be cruel or, or mean, but yet because of the culture that I'm in, like I've been programmed to hear these kinds of questions in a in a particular and hurtful way. Paul had no, he, he didn't mean them that way. I'm just inclined to hear them that way. Now, I'm telling you that this morning because surely, friends, I am not the only person that has that tendency. I know I'm weird, but some of you are weirder than I am, right? You just are. So can we observe together and confess together this morning, friends, that lots of folks in the world that we live in take things way more personally than they're intended to be taken, Right? Man, we live in a a world where folks are just so ready to fly off the handle about anything and everything. I I have a tendency to to be too sensitive sometimes. And because I have that tendency from time to time, I I need to be reminded that not everything I hear every day is personal. It's not. And and, and every person that's different than me isn't, isn't intending to offend me or to harm me. And friends, it's true for you as well. It is so true for you. So a verse that I've, I've always found to be really helpful um, when it comes to dealing with situations that are either tense or, or just feel tense is James 1.19. It says these words, Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Man, those are, are such good words. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. If you need a, a verse to hang your hat on every day this week, hang it on that one. Um, don't you think our world would be a, a tremendously different place if folks lived by that verse? Man be good. That's not something that will ever just happen, friends. We can't just read that verse and and move on with our day and not give it a second thought. That's, it's a choice we have to make. Like, you're going to have to choose to live that verse out, to live those words out. So, um, so after asking a whole bunch of questions in verse one, Paul moves on in verse two to pleading for the folks in Philippi to act in a way that Paul says will make him truly happy. Uh, Speaking of being truly happy, uh, what kinds of things make you truly happy these days? What kinds of things make you truly happy these days? Maybe for some of us, a white sand beach, beautiful blue water and a cloudless sky. Have you been to the beach lately? 
If you haven't, you should. You live right by it. There are poor, miserable folks who live in the middle of Kansas today that have to drive forever to get here. You should appreciate it. Um, maybe, maybe one of the things that make us truly happy is a meal to prepare and family around the table and time spent together. Anybody wish they could just gather the family around the table at home for lunch today? Yeah. Uh, maybe for some of us, what would make us truly happy is a, a car or a yard or a DIY project. I'm in that camp. Um, maybe for some of us, an empty house and a comfy couch and a new Netflix series to binge would, would make us truly happy. Uh, here lately, our weenie dog has been a truly happy girl. Like, she is in her happy place. We've been doing some work in our backyard, and that's involved rock. And man, I've, I've showed you videos before. That dog is cuckoo over rocks. Um, I, every, every, I started every morning this week on the patio um, for a couple of hours until I started to sweat, and then I went inside. But man, I, before I started to sweat, I almost had to go inside every day because she had her dumb rock, and she was driving me insane with that thing. Man, destroying plants and all kinds of things. I, some days I'm convinced the devil lives inside of her. But anyway, uh, she, she was a, she's a happy girl when she got a rock. So in verse 2 of our text, Paul writes that what would make him truly happy, what would make his, his joy whole and complete in some translations, say, uh, would be knowing that the Philippian folk were living in a wholehearted agreement, loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. Uh, when I think about that verse and those words, the idea of working in a wholehearted agreement and loving one another, uh, the first thing that comes to mind are some of the, uh, the mission trips I was able to lead and be a part of as a, as a student ministry pastor. Um, while we were in Hutch, uh, we, I, every spring break, every, every year, I'd take a group of high school juniors and seniors down to Galveston, Texas, and we would spend uh, several days serving and, and playing together. Love, absolutely love those trips. Uh, generally, we'd spend at least a day or two volunteering for Habitat for Humanity on those trips. And one year, um, we, we showed up, and they needed a, a sod laid in a couple of yards. And, and in my mind, I'm just thinking, yes, like that is the perfect project to do with a bunch of high schoolers, right? Like you don't, it's not, it doesn't require a lot of knowledge. You got a whole bunch of able-bodied, young, energetic folk, and you can just crank some work out. So we show up at the first house, and immediately I noticed that in the middle of this front yard, there are two giant piles of brick, like full pallets, full pallets of, of brick. And you can fit a whole lot of brick on a pallet. And so we're, we're kind of doing some prep work and doing some raking and leveling out the yard and stuff. And I asked the, the soup, the habitat soup, that's there. I said, hey, so what's the plan for the bricks? And he's like, well, in his mind, we needed like a forklift or a skid steer or something to move these bricks out of the way. And, and I said, really? And I was like, we don't, we don't need that. Like, we got 15 high schoolers here, man. And so we, we, we lined up, and we started an assembly line. And, and one brick at a time in about 20 minutes, like this group of, of young people, just moved every single brick, not just out of the way, but to the places they were, they were supposed to go. And it was really, it was so much fun to watch and to, to be a part of. And for me, it was a beautiful picture of what it looks like for a group of folks to, to work together with one mind and purpose. I know you've, you've experienced these kinds of moments in life as well. So what Paul is getting at in, in this verse and with this idea is that we are better together. Friends, we are better together. He's getting at the fact that we do our best work not when we are by ourselves, but we do our best work when we're with others. In Matthew 18, 20, Jesus said, Where two or three are gathered together in my name, I will be there with them. It's not that Jesus isn't with us when we're not together, but it's that we are so much closer to leaning into the image we were created in when we are together, uh, when we choose to do life and to labor together. When I tell people about our remodel here at, at the church, which, by the way, I love telling people about, my favorite part of the story is this, that we didn't pay somebody to do this, friends. We did this together right? Together, we did this. Together, we got behind a vision, and together, we gave, and together, we, we worked, and we sweat, and we prayed, and now together, we get to enjoy a, a beautiful and, and refreshed worship space that together we get to share with others. I love that. I love that. Friends, we have always been and will always be better together. Now, with that said, uh, let me also touch on what I think Paul doesn't mean here. What Paul doesn't mean um, is that he, he uh, wanted them to agree, 
hang on. What, what he doesn't mean is that he wanted them to become a bunch of brainwashed robots, right, that talked and looked and thought and behaved all exactly the same. And one of the ways we can know that is by reading some, some more stuff from Paul in other parts of the New Testament. So he wrote another letter, lots of other letters actually, but he wrote another letter to a group of folk in a city called Galatia. And in that letter, in chapter 3, verse 28, Paul wrote these words, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So in that verse, Paul references the fact that no matter how many barriers there are amongst a group of people, if they wholeheartedly commit themselves to to Jesus, the difference he makes in their lives trumps everything, right? The difference Jesus makes in us should trump every barrier. And in fact, it, it doesn't even trump that barrier, but it converts that barrier into a strength instead of a weakness, So if we are truly and deeply and wholeheartedly committed to Jesus, then when we look at other folks, we won't see Republican or Democrat, right? We won't see black or white, or we won't see gay or straight, or we won't see rich or poor or any of those things. We'll see family members and co-journeyers and friends that God has blessed us with that make us stronger and make us better and make us more Jesus like. So choosing to to appreciate our differences many times means choosing to be humble and and putting the needs of others in front of our our own needs. And that's exactly where Paul goes in the next two verses, verses three and four. Uh, And by the way, if you're sleepy, I'm almost done. So wake up. Uh, Last week, uh, I I talked about the fact that sometimes the best way to illustrate a point is by talking about the reverse of that that point. So as I was thinking about Paul's words in our, our text um, this past week about being humble. Uh, A kid from our our church in South Florida, the first church I was on staff at, came to mind. Uh, He's a kid named Carl. Carl's a great kid. Stacy's shaking her head back there. Carl had a mouth on him like nobody you have ever met. Friends, if Carl was talking, Carl was talking trash. Man, I wanted to smack that kid so many times. I never did, but I wanted to. He's a good kid, though. Uh, I'd take the van to, uh, the church van, to pick up Carl and a bunch of his buddies on Tuesdays and and, uh, and by default, every single week, there was no discussion about it. Carl got in the front seat because that's just what Carl did. That's who Carl was. He'd, he'd get in, and every single week, he'd do the exact same thing. He'd reach right over for the radio and start to change the station, right? And every week, I would do the exact same thing. I'd smack his hand out of the way, and I'd tell him, no, that, that wasn't happening. Carl was cocky, and he was arrogant, and he was mouthy, and pretty much everything except humble. I know we've all known a Carl, haven't we? Yeah, but man, I love that kid. Still do. What a, you just couldn't help but but love him. When we played uh, basketball on Tuesday nights back in those days, typically it would be Carl and about 20 of his friends. They were all all Haitian, all came from a Haitian community. And um, and it would be me, the token white dude, and about 20 Haitian dudes in there. And choosing to be humble in that setting was no problem. Absolutely no problem at all because it was pretty much the only choice I had. Um, They were faster than me. They were better than me. They were bigger than me. They were so much louder than me. Man, they were loud. So loud. Surely you've been humbled like that too at some point in your life. You've been in a moment, sort of a moment that humbled you as opposed to choosing to be humble in a moment. And that's what Paul's getting at here. It's one thing to be humbled, but it's entirely another, friends, to choose to, to grab your bootstraps and pull yourself up and to literally choose to live your life in a way that's humble. That's what Paul's getting at in verses 3 and 4. He says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Don't look out only for your own interests. Um, would anybody be willing to, to confess alongside me this morning that it's, it's kind of hard to not, just, to not just be self-absorbed in a, in a global pandemic? Like, isn't it, isn't it kind of hard to... Uh, here, here's how that plays out in my life. As you know, we're gathering health supplies to share with our friends over at Lincoln Park Elementary, right? Yeah, as I've been gathering things for Stacy and I to, to donate, I've noticed that there's a part of me that struggles with giving these things away. Like, I, I find them, and I want to hang on to them. Like, I want to I wanna keep them. Uh, another temptation I find myself having to resist is the temptation to hoard things. Like, I just want to build a stockpile, right? Like, I just want, I want to fill my garage with toilet paper, I don't, I don't necessarily 
want to build a stockpile, but, but inside of me, there's just, there's just something, this desire that, that, isn't, that won't ever be happy with just having enough. And I would imagine to some degree, we probably all have at least a little bit of that in us, some more, maybe some less. Friends, the problem with hoarding resources and having more than enough is that inevitably we stop trusting God. We stop trusting God to provide for us, and we begin trusting in the resources that we've provided for ourselves. If if you don't want to take my word for it, read the scriptures. It happens again and again and again in the, the over the course of the Old Testament, even into the New Testament. And I'm not saying that we need to become people who just who just live on the fly, waiting to 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 begin looking for what we need in the moment that we need it. But what I'm saying is that we need to be purposeful about letting places in the scriptures like Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, really get inside of us and form and shape our gathering habits. So as I wrap up here, let me just ask you some, some questions to contemplate. Friends, when it comes to gathering resources, are we, are we gathering with just ourselves in mind or are we heeding Paul's words to not be selfish and are we gathering with the hope of having a little something to share with somebody else? When it comes to gathering resources, are we more concerned with, with creating a stockpile that we can take some photos of and post on social media and say, hey, look at my stockpile or are we more concerned with having enough supplies so that we can purposefully give some things way. Friends, our culture tells us to do the opposite of that, by the way. When it comes to gathering resources, are we pridefully choosing to retain ownership of what we gather, or have we chosen to make a habit of humbly turning over everything we have to Jesus and letting him do with it however and whatever he sees fit? Can I just tell you I'm so thankful today to be a part of a church that I would describe as a family of givers. Like we're you're just generous people. And I'm so thankful to be to be a witness of that and to get to be a part of that kind of a family. You're a bunch of folks that are happy to give in all kinds of ways. But the last question I want to ask us this morning is this. Friends, is there more that we can give? Is there more that we can give that we haven't already as I asked that question, my friend Josh Foskey in the sound booth comes to mind. I texted he and Callie yesterday about being here a little bit early this morning, and he, his reply was, just like a pastor to ask for more, and it's so true. I know, I know that's the world that we live in. It's what comes to mind. But friends, I, don't, I think it's a really serious question. Is, is there more? Is there more time or money or attention or whatever resource, ability, or commodity you want to fill in that blank with that God is inviting us to give today? Might God be inviting us to to give more this morning and in doing so, giving us the opportunity to grow in God and to be further used by by God? Let's pray together. God, I'm thankful. Um, I'm thankful today, Lord, for for this this family that gathers every week. Um, And I, I believe wholeheartedly, Lord, that they desire to be formed and shaped by you. That's what I want for me too, Lord. I'm grateful to be challenged by your scriptures, to be challenged to to not just give more, but to want to give more, God. Would you work in us, Jesus? Week after week, we gather and we, a lot of the things we talk about, they are things we just can't do on our own, but we desperately need you to work in us. So Lord, would you, in a new way, would you own us today? At a deeper level, God, might we belong to you today? Uh, in some way, shape, or form, might the things that you have blessed us with, resources, relationships, uh, all of those things, might they belong a little bit more to you today and a little bit less to us? God, help us to remember that as we purposefully choose to, to do those kinds of things, to make those kinds of decisions, to follow your lead that it helps bring your kingdom here. That we're not, just, we're not just doing things to be nice, but we're doing Jesus kind of work, kingdom kind of work. We're helping you bring your kingdom here, Lord. God, thank you. Thank you for loving us today. That's why you challenge us week after week because you love us. And you know that our, our best life is, is life lived in deep relationship with you. And that's what we want today. So grow us in you, Lord. We're grateful for your love and your goodness. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And real quick, we have a, a
Actually, I was going to say a couple. We have one major announcement. We want to remind you we are still taking donations for Lincoln Park. Um, so if you find any of those items and you want to donate them, that would be fantastic. There's actually little apples out there with the items that we need. So if you have forgotten what we need uh, and you need those, you just take that reminder with you. And as you're out shopping, grab those items. But another way you can do it is if you feel more comfortable about just giving a monetary donation, you can do that as well. Um, and we'll send out a shopper to find these items. Um, if that makes it easier on you, we can go that route too. Just want to remind you about that. And I cannot help but close the service with a blessing. So if you would all please stand with me and allow me to give you this blessing. If you're at home, stand and allow me to give you this blessing. And I always say, you can't take anything with your hands in your pockets. So if you would please, outstretch your hands and accept this. May you come to see that you belong to Christ. And that may you find comfort in his love. And that may you share that love in community with everyone around you because we are better together. Go in Christ's name. Amen.